We've got breaking news tonight in the case of Donald Trump versus the USA, also known as the Justice Department's investigation of classified documents seized from the former guy's Florida club. Tonight, Judge Aileen Cannon met the DOJ's deadline and appointed a special master to go through the material the FBI found during the search. Judge Raymond Deary, submitted by Trump's legal team and agreed to by DOJ lawyers, will be getting the job. He now has until November 30th to complete his review. But... Judge Cannon denied a key DOJ request to continue reviewing classified material as part of its criminal investigation. DOJ has said it would appeal the judge's ruling to the 11th Circuit, so stay tuned. Meanwhile, NBC News has confirmed Trump's former chief of staff, Mark Meadows, on your screen right there, has complied with a subpoena from the Justice Department's investigation into the six. That now makes him the highest-ranking ex-Trump official to do so. Tonight, The Washington Post has new reporting on the dozens of other January 6 subpoenas that were issued over the last week. The Post says it reviewed three of the subpoenas, which covered, quote, 18 separate categories of information, including any communications the recipients had with scores of people in six different states where supporters of then-President Trump sought to promote what are known as alternate electors. Today, Trump, in an interview, was asked about the possibility he could get charged and here's some of what he had to say. Do you feel like the Department of Justice is trying to indict you, Mr. President? Well, there is no reason that they can. I did absolutely, you've seen the legal papers, absolutely nothing wrong. I think if it happened, I think you'd have problems in this country, the likes of which perhaps we've never seen before. I don't think the people of the United States would stand for it. What kind of problems, Mr. President? I think they'd have big problems. Big problems. Also, the January 6th Congressional Committee now saying justice officials will have to wait to get a look at their findings. The panel's chairman says it will not hand over any information until after the final report is complete. We need to say clearly and forcefully white supremacy, all forms of hate fueled by violence have no place in America. Fair to call it out as complicity. My dad would say, if your silence is complicity, we can't remain silent. There's those who say, we bring this up, we just divide the country. Bring it up, we silence it, instead of remaining silence. For in silence, wounds deepen. President Biden once again blasting hate-fueled political violence in our nation, violence that exists in large part because of lies and conspiracies. We're all very, very familiar with Donald Trump's big lie, the one that sparked the Capitol riot. But there are many other lies about things like Barack Obama's birthplace and the so-called deep state. And the new Peacock docuseries, Shadowland, aims to explore it all. A conspiracy theory is a theory that there is someone bigger that is pulling the strings. There are wealthy, powerful families that control everything the nazis are coming they're here our elections were stolen you devil worshiping satan is witch the rule of law in this country has been eliminated there's money to be made here people are dying that don't they are trying to manufacture anger. I lost everything I ever worked for. I miss my dad all the time. This is really pulling people in. I'm never going to talk to him again. Here with us tonight, Joe Berlinger, Oscar-nominated documentary filmmaker and executive producer of Shadowland. All six episodes of the series will premiere September 21st on Peacock. Joe, this is a, a stunning piece of work you put together. I want to know, did any one person, one event, get us to this point? That's a great question. You know, the easy answer is, first of all, thank you for having me. I'm a big fan of the show. Um, the easy answer, of course, is uh, social media. But I actually look further back. There was a time when there were, you know, three networks, and there was a dividing line between you know, the news division and the entertainment division. And at, at a certain point, uh, the line fell and, and uh, ratings and selling ads and all that stuff became important for news. And then the explosion of cable networks and 24-hour news cycle. I think 
our, generally our media culture has allowed a lot of opinion to get into uh, uh, the dialogue and that then intersected with social media and it's been it's been a decades long progression of where people just don't know what the truth is well certain people don't know what the truth is um and it's 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 deeply troubling you know like my iphone is is the greatest device you can imagine uh we've never had more information than available at our fingertips but there's never been a time where the truth has been so elusive for so many people and I think this is this is destroying democracy. And for this show, what I wanted to do was really not get into the finger pointing and the demonization that has happened. We've divided into two camps and we demonize one another. And we each side looks at the other side as you know as two dimensional human beings. And we don't we don't have any dialogue anymore. And I think that's the that that is destroying the democracy. It, it, it will destroy democracy if people can't come together and compromise. And so instead of doing the usual finger pointing, I wanted to do a, a, a deep dive into the world of conspiracy thinking, understand, at least try to understand how people come to their views, you know, without without judgment. You know. What I found That's most fascinating when you follow these stories, what you end up following is the money. People don't realize that much of this whole conspiracy theory universe is really a multi-billion dollar industry. Alex Jones, probably the best known but he's only the tip of the iceberg, isn't he? Exactly. People want, we follow a guy named Pastor Locke who wants to build his church. Uh, we follow people who are wanting to sell products. So there are people who know better. There are political leaders who know better. There are people in Congress who know better, but they're taking advantage and manipulating regular people for whom life has not gone well, and they're looking for an answer. Um, and that's the thing that's shameful that I find in, in you know, our, our leaders who are knowingly promoting uh, conspiracy theories. It's, it, it, but they're what we've learned. Like we we spent time with a woman in uh, uh, in rural Pennsylvania. She owns a pizza shop. If you were driving through rural Pennsylvania and stopped off at her pizza shop, you'd think she 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 was a lovely person, and you'd want to sit and chat with her. And she felt feels like, you know, an American, and yet she's in. January 6th in the Capitol calling for Nancy Pelosi's head. And she's sitting in prison right now awaiting trial. But she deeply believes, you know, I, I want I want to have empathy for, for these people who, because of the people who are making money off her and manipulating her politically, I want to have some empathy to try to understand where these people are coming from so that we can we can talk because if we don't talk, we are headed down a very dangerous path, in my opinion. Decency, empathy, compassion. Those are things we all need to have. Calling for Nancy Pelosi's head Thanks. and storming the Capitol. Not so much. Joe Berlinger, thank you so much. And you at home can watch Shadowland on Peacock starting Wednesday. I highly recommend it. Most of the people who came had only a shopping bag with perhaps one change of clothing. No money, knowing nobody. It was one of the most inhuman things that I have ever seen. The last thing before we go tonight, the reverse freedom rides. Ron DeSantis' cruel stunt yesterday echoes one pulled exactly 60 years ago. In 1962, a group of conservatives, furious over the civil rights movement and the freedom rides throughout the South the year before, hatched a cruel plan intended to upset liberals up in the North. They handed out flyers like this one on your screen, recruiting Southern black families to get on buses to Northern states with the false promise of good jobs and housing when they arrived. One place in particular was Hyannis in Cape Cod, where the Kennedys vacationed. Take a listen to what the architects of the reverse freedom rides had to say at the time. The ultimate accomplishment, of course, has already been uh, obtained, and that is to focus attention on the hypocrisy of the Northern liberals and the NAACP, Urban League, and people like that especially. We intend to continue it until those uh, people in the majority tell those politicians we are through with this foolishness about uh, civil rights and uh, things that you're using for political purposes. Sound familiar? Well, the joke was on them, much like it is on Governor Ron DeSantis, because the community rallied around these families who arrived in Cape Cod. As historian Clive Webb put it, 
the white conservatives who were behind that campaign then actually underestimated the decency of many ordinary people. And we are seeing the very same thing today in Martha's Vineyard. Restaurants, students, people all over volunteering to help those in need. It is an important reminder, never ever underestimate the decency of ordinary people.